it failed to give so many people a fair go. Now let there be no mistake, the practice of Pacific expulsion caused severe and enduring harm on a mass scale to so many innocent people. Amidst the recent bout of political jousting over refugees, which continues, we have witnessed, I think, a strange revisionism, which somehow recasts the Nauru option as relatively humane, or at least almost inexorably necessary to revive. <coughs> to my mind, this displays a disturbing disregard for the overwhelming evidence of the deep inhumanity and damage wrought by the experiment. Damage, that is, which was determined by the policy driving it all, deterrence. An inherent aspect of deterrence is its punitive potential. It considers it justifiable, acceptable, to punish and harm innocent people, including children, to stop others coming. The logic of it requires that to be effective, it must be harsh. It must be harsh. It must hurt. Otherwise, it won't deter. And I can assure you that during my work in Nauru with colleagues representing refugees, I saw firsthand unaccompanied kids and grown <coughs> men alike disintegrating. Now, amidst the white noise uh, about the High Court case, um, in my judgment, uh, the case has been subjected to some very serious mischaracterisation by the body politic. Um, that mischaracterisation has been as misleading as it is illuminating, I think, about the culture of denial of a fair go for asylum seekers and how deeply it currently cuts. Just a couple of examples, a couple of observations. In political discourse, a common refrain has been that the Malaysia case was brought, steered and operated as a vehicle, if you like, a semi-trailer, if you like, of social change. Um, as if it was somehow a radical adventure, or even, to say in this conference, progressive. Um, political leaders have provoked and perpetuated this narrative. In particular, the court's judgment has been sharply criticised by the Prime Minister herself. At the time of the judgment, um, upon the judgment, the essence of the criticisms, as far as one can comprehend them, were twofold. Firstly, that the court was activist, that it somehow changed the law, or if you like, turned the interpretation of the law on its head. And secondly, that the court missed an opportunity to send a very strong message of deterrence to people smugglers. So on the one hand, it was said, it was asserted that they were inappropriately activist, and on the other hand, when it came to deterrence policy, not activist enough. These criticisms, I think, are as confused and incoherent as they are wrong. The only opportunity which arose for the court was to consider the case before it, and the court discharged its function as required under the separation of powers to decide the dispute by appropriate application of the law to the facts before it, and to do so independently without regard to the political or policy consequences which may flow. It's as if some political leaders temporarily forgot what the law means. The claim to radicalism is, in fact, a perversion of the reality and shows how far we have drifted from our centre. Very normal, it was a very normal and very reasonable thing to do in this country what those people did in asking for our assistance. Nothing radical, nothing revolutionary, in fact, utterly conventional, I would suggest. What they did is what anyone in this country can do. And that is, if they're concerned about whether the government actually has the power to do something which it proposes to do to them, um, they have every right in this country, whoever you are, wherever you're from, to ask a court whether that is in fact so, whether there is the legal power to do that. Um, and um, as conventional as seeking and affording people a fair go, um, it is also completely conventional uh, for lawyers uh, to respond uh, to that type of call and to present a case to the court. Imagine for a moment a human rights lawyer getting a call uh, from people in this type of situation going, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you because there's actually a government policy being pursued and it's contrary uh, to what you want to ask the court. Well, quite harmless, I think, is 
<laughs> I think also um, the government uh, in seeking to, uh, I think the government's response in proposing legislation which sought to circumvent uh, the ruling of the court was again a another graphic illustration of how far we have deviated and how far we are prepared to deviate from the fair go before the law in this area. So instead of accepting the ruling of the High Court, the government uh, proposed laws which were uh, which didn't end up passing into, it didn't end up um, being successful and weren't enacted, but proposed laws which were in essence extreme, in essence in fact radical. Um, they sought to hand the minister an almost unfettered discretion to expel anyone, anywhere, without even having to consider what would happen to them. This law literally proposed uh, to provide one person in this country, the minister, with a power to, which didn't even require him to consider the human rights protections or consequences of the decision. It also specifically ousted the rules of natural justice from consideration, uh, and also said that ultimately, the key test was whether the expulsion, the transfer of asylum seekers would be in the national interest, whether it would be in the national interest. As a package, legislative package, it essentially sought to ask the rule of law from consideration of the fate of vulnerable people in this context. Now, the current situation, very briefly, is that a strange bipartisanship now hangs over Canberra on the question of asylum seekers. Both major parties are committed to a policy of offshore processing, that is, expulsion of asylum seeker boat arrivals to another country for processing and human warehousing. And yet, and the legislative architecture uh, to do that potentially remains in place. And so does the possibility of introduction into Parliament of laws which seek again to ask the rule of law from governing the fate of future arrivals. I want to very briefly, before wrapping up, uh, turn to the policy of mandatory indefinite detention of asylum seekers as another example of a, another graphic example of the denial of a fair go uh, to asylum seekers before the law. Um, notorious uh, is the fact um, that we have mandatory indefinite detention uh, for uh, those, under, those asylum seekers who arrive by boat who are undergoing processing. That is, while undergoing processing, the law mandates that detention uh, be uh, indefinite and, and as a practical consequence in many uh, respects prolonged. Um, on recent figures, over 4,000 people remain detained in these circumstances, including hundreds of children. I want to, however, turn to another um, aspect of this mandatory detention scheme, another consequence. It's not for those undergoing processing um, who are required under law to remain detained for the duration of processing. Um, I want to briefly, incidentally, I should refer to the fact that it is welcome that um, more people are being released while, while, while their processing goes on. That's very welcome. But I want to turn very briefly to a second um, uh, group of people, and that is those who have already been assessed to be refugees but remain detained indefinitely because of an adverse security assessment by, by ASIO. I know of one example where a man in this country has been found to be a refugee four times. He's been found twice by the UNHCR in separate countries to be a refugee and twice by the Australian government here to be a refugee and remains detained for over two years he's remained detained, incarcerated in Australia, trapped in a twilight world, a Kafkaesque nightmare because ASIO issued him with an adverse security assessment he has absolutely no idea what it is that supposedly makes him a risk to security in this country. Because the way that this scheme works at the moment in Australia, um, the way that the law works is um, that there is no requirement, and in fact in practice, no ability for those who have been um, uh, assessed to be an adverse security risk to know the supposed case against them. In other words, there is a complete denial procedural fairness. There is no proper opportunity for people to answer any um, supposed case against them, which could quite, quite possibly result in people remaining detained, not only indefinitely, for the rest of their lives. Um, so if you think about one of the golden threads of our legal system, that is procedural fairness, um, uh, you have to ask the question here, how on earth could someone be considered to be given a fair go? 
Now, in both areas of offshore processing and detention, there has been some progress in recent times. But the source and shape of this progress also points to a fundamental problem. In both cases, the role of the law and the courts remains limited. Yes, we were able to rely on the courts in relation to the Malaysian case, but the court ruled on the current law, not laws which seek to circumvent it. And with detention, the implementation of the policy of detention as a last resort is discretionary, not enforceable by law. That is, that is um, while after the announcement of reform three years ago, thousands of people remain incarcerated indefinitely. That is why they remain incarcerated indefinitely. And to be sure of the limitations, we don't need only to turn um, briefly to when the government sought successfully um, to maintain mandatory detention in 2004, mandatory indefinite detention of asylum seekers, by drawing upon older sources of rights in the case of El Kateb, where the High Court ruled by the majority that it was lawful to indefinitely detain an asylum seeker. The court confirmed that it was lawful to detain an asylum seeker indefinitely. This inexorably leads to the conclusion that our legal system is not resilient and responsive enough to consistently deliver fairness and justice in this area, and that a federal human rights charter would enrich and fortify human rights protections where the ability of the law and parliamentary processes has so often failed. International human rights law prohibits arbitrary and inhumane detention of people, including asylum seekers. Australian law has not, and still does not, and detention remains ill-defined, inconsistent and opaque. It has not been legalised and 500 children or thereabouts remain indefinitely locked up while seeking protection from abuse abroad. Now, in closing, um, I, I want to make a few brief observations. Much of the political debate has focused on competing claims made in the name of the national interest including the law that was proposed to circumvent the High Court case. In this political jousting, the equation continues to be so often reduced to a competition over who can devise the tougher policy in the treatment of vulnerable people coming here seeking our help. I arrive at a different, at, at, at a different question for our country and our future, and that is whether we can reach a different understanding of the national interest which does not involve seeking um, to all but oust the rule of law from its traditional role of scrutinising the conduct of government, which does not seek to circumvent laws here and internationally, but seeks to restore the golden threads of our legal system, such as the rule of law, and to comply with human rights obligations, and to minimise, not compound harm, to people fleeing from it. Surely it would be more in our national interest to adopt such an approach to how we treat vulnerable people in peril. In, the, in this context, I think we should raise the debate above and beyond whether we should have onshore or offshore processing to a different question, and that is how can we construct a better plan, a framework in the region which makes a real difference to protection of the many vulnerable people in the region. And we should ensure that we do not, in the meantime, expose people fleeing from harm to the risk of further harm in the future. The pursuit of protecting borders should not overrun the obligation we signed up to almost 15 years ago under the Refugees Convention, and that the law, and, and, and that which the law and common decency to fellow human beings dictates, and that is the protection of people. Thank you.